So anyway, Mary Lou, it's uh, your show. You want to introduce our guest? Good morning. Thank you all for coming today. Now we get to the heart of our meeting, and that's our educational piece. Today is health, and our speaker is Brad Hyde. Brad Hyde is the uh, business development specialist at Delta Medical Center, which keeps him very busy. But in addition to that, Brad is a certified home security and workplace violence. Um, he's, he's certified in that through Homeland Security. And he also is a first responder with FEMA and Homeland Security. Not to mention being a very dynamic speaker, so I'm setting him up. You better be, you better be on, your, on your eight game today. Um, I know Brad for several years, and he has been a speaker at several conferences I've attended. And I'm grateful that you're able to come today and speak with us. Alright, let's give him a little yeah. All right, let me make sure. Alright, I'm on the right page. Right. There. Not in line. Not in line. I'm a mover. I move around. So, uh, one thing I wanted to say, thank you, Mary Lou, for uh, that introduction to my most boring presentation I, I give. So, uh, it, it's really uh, about uh, securing yourself. So, we're going to talk about ways to uh, secure your, your workplace and uh, secure yourself. So, there's going to be... Can everybody see that? Okay. Um, so, what we're going to talk about is uh, workplace violence. And in this day and age, we see all kinds of, of things that happen at workplace. In fact, you know, the majority of our time uh, that we spend awake is spent at, um, at our place of work or our place of education. Um, so what it comes down to is, you know, these statistics that go along. And so I'm going to talk to you about tips. Um, I don't usually give handouts. There's my email is in the um, in the flyer. I, I don't like giving handout, handouts. One, I like to be the center of attention when I'm talking, so I don't have like anybody reading my head. Two, my ego can't take when I walk out of the room and the, the trash can beside the door is full of my handouts. So I, I, it, my ego can't take that. I tried to set my ego aside one day, but I don't do that kind of heavy lifting. So, you know, I want, I want y'all, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to message me and I will I'll provide this presentation to you. Um, and I'll try to my best to ask, answer any questions that you have. Um, but here's some statistics uh, uh, about, you know, with workplace violence. Uh, you know, uh, it's, these are things that have happened in the last few years. We, we see it on the news all the time um, about, you know, like for instance, Connecticut, four state lottery executives were killed by a lottery accountant in Hawaii, a Xerox technician killed several workers. What this really talks about is that there's not a, a very big dynamic or demographic of what a person who looks like uh, they're going to be a uh, workplace violent person. The, the only statistic that is kind of true is that men are more likely to be a perpetrator than, than women. So that's just, that's a... Uh, the only demographic that's really not necessarily racial, it's really not necessarily uh, socioeconomic, it's none of those things. It's really uh, just comes down to most workplace violence is situational, meaning that it has to do with something personally happening at that facility or that particular person. And you know what that comes down to? One of the things that we hear a lot about is school shootings um, and terrorism. Those are, those are workplace uh, um, violence situations. Uh, they're not necessarily characterized that way, but you know, usually everybody that's involved are, are working there. And it comes down to many different aspects of it. It comes down to assaults, domestic violence, stalking, threats. Harassment, sexual harassment is a workplace violence situation. And the reason why I include it is because we tend to categorize things at work. 
And sometimes they diminish their seriousness, not to say that, you know, calling it sexual harassment at work, uh, that's not diminishing it, but it is a form of workplace violence that we should be aware of. Because we think of, when we hear violence, we just think it's someone hitting someone, someone shooting someone, and that is not uh, the only form of violence that, that is out there. And so here's some statistics. They're older um, because really uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, entities that collect this uh, totality. But, you know, there's a lot of homicides, sexual harassment, um, sexual assault, aggravated assault, simple assault. Um, all those things, uh, they predominantly happen at our workplace. Um, and, you know, we feel like, okay, it's going to be that one time where that person just snaps and comes in and kills us all. Um, and that is, that is not how workplace violence happens. Workplace violence is a slow kettle that brews, sometimes for years. It's never going to be that one thing that you said to Eddie in the IT department, now he's going to come back and, and kill me. No. Um, there are always warning signs, and we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some warning signs, both professionally, but they're gonna talk to you personally, and they're gonna talk to you about how you can see these threats um, up front for you as an individual. And this does not mean just you at work. This can be you in the parking lot. This can be you at school. This can be you in your home. Um, so let's talk about that first of all. So. Uh, how many people have, have ever gotten on an elevator? You're the only one on the elevator, and then someone else gets on the elevator with you, and you feel a little uncomfortable in that situation. So you've gotten on the elevator, and you feel. Let's, let's see. Uh, how many in the room? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. So if you look, it's, it's predominantly... Um, females, and how many of you, when you feel that uncomfortableness, that you stay on the elevator, <laughs> and you ride it up or down or wherever with the person you're feeling uncomfortable with? Because we as human beings, we don't like to offend people. Oh, I don't want to, you know, this guy just stepped on, and it'll be embarrassing if I just step off. Um, and watch the doors close as he's looking at me, or you know. Um, but guess what? You as a human being have a response. It's I've worked in mental health care for over 20 years, and we have built-in mechanisms to protect us. It's, one of them is called fight or flight, and we don't always know. It's it's part of your primitive brain. And sometimes your primitive brain sees things that are warning you. Now we, as modern uh, people with egos and with uh, all this, we often ignore our primitive brain. And we, and we disregard what it's telling us. Because what's your primitive brain in that situation where you see somebody who makes you feel uncomfortable? It has seen something, a warning sign, that says, beware. And oftentimes, uh, uh, for instance, women who have been assaulted in parking garages or in elevators, the first thing when they're interviewed after that was, I felt uncomfortable with this person when I first saw them. So here's what you've got to answer for yourself. You've got to answer for yourself, is it important to maintain dignity or safety? And I'm here to tell you that your safety, if you don't know the answer to that question, <laughs> your safety is more important than your dignity. Now that's I, I, I'm a single father of two children, so I'm raising a 17 year old right now and a 13 year old. If that is if that's not a situation that tells me uh, safety is more important than dignity, I don't know what it is. 
Because things always happen where I'm like, oh, Lord, get, no. <laughs> you know, my son, my son, I, I didn't really know how annoying I was until I created a miniature version of me <laughs> and then started arguing with it every day. That's, I, I look at him sometimes and talk to him and I think, how do I have friends? I don't even know. My daughter, uh, the other day, asked, she said to me, she says, which of us do you love the most? And I said, I love you equally. And she goes, really? And I said, I don't really like neither one of you, but I, I do love you. And so, you know, that's how, that's, uh, you have to be uh, frank and honest, and you have to understand these situations. Are you often, if you think back, if you really analyze situations where you were in danger, there were warning signs before. Whether you're in a, whether you're in a, a, your car and something happens dangerously there, it might be that you were texting two seconds earlier and you're like, oh, I was an idiot, you know. Or you might have... Uh, uh, one digit wave at somebody and that just cuts you off. That's what we call it, one digit wave. Um, so, you know, we talk about all men are created equal in, in America, and they are. All people are created equal. We're all equal. But violent situations are not equal. Threats are not equal. And I don't want to give you um, uh, an excuse to overreact with threats and situations. I don't want you to do that. Because that overreaction can make situations worse. So let's talk about some things you can do at your workplace that can help. One of the most important things to do is to listen and gather information. Document what's happening. Understand what's going on. Make sure you train yourself and your staff on who is working for you and who you're working with and how you can be a better one. So, you know, when you're gathering information, let's say you have a particular person that you're concerned about. Well, if you feel like someone is a threat, you need to start gathering information. Gather their age, marital status, previous leg health, all these things. Um, understand that blue-collar workers and, and white-collar workers, there's not a predominance of any workplace violence more in work in blue collar situations than there are in white collar situations. Oh, that was me for a minute there. So, <laughs> where is that coming from? Um, understand that there are conflicts that you work. I work at a mental hospital. So when I come there, I understand that this is a different environment than other places. Not necessarily my house, because that's a little bit of a mental hospital too. <laughs> But so let's say we have an individual. Let's say we have a person that is potentially a threat. We've, we recognize this person's a threat. So what you want to first do is engage with that person. Here's what it comes down to. Two things, if you don't leave with anything but these two things, besides I'm a great speaker, is that two things you need to leave with is communication is most important. And... Um, being aware of your surroundings is the second. <coughs> so how many people, when you pull into your driveway or your carport, do you look around? How many people, when you park in a parking lot, look around? It's about our perceptions, right? It's about perceptions. So let me tell you quickly about our perception. Now, I told you I was a single father, two kids. So my daughter was about... Five years old, and my mother at the time said, your daughter needs some new underwear. Because men, we just wear our underwear until the atoms disintegrate. And we're just like, oh, I don't know where my underwear is. I've got to go buy some new ones. So I needed to, to get my, my daughter some new underwear. So one day, one Saturday, we went out running around in, in the day, and finally I had to go to Walmart. Now, I didn't want to take these two kids to Walmart with me. I was debating on taking them home with me. So, I did. so my parents lived near Walmart, so it was late one night. It was about 10 o'clock, 10.30. I went by my parents' house and said, can my kids stay right here? Your grandkids stay right here while I go to Walmart. Because I was only going to get four things at Walmart, okay? But when I, when 
when I got to Walmart and I picked up my four things and took them to the little checkout. Of course, it's late at night, so it's just this one checkout girl. There's 34 lines. There ain't nobody in the line. It's just me and her at the end of this checkout. I put my four things up on the, the checkout. And she started to look nervous. And I'm like, what are you, oh Lord. <laughs> because when you work in mental health care, people kind of think, you know, the, the mentally challenged people gravitate to you. I don't know if it's a sign, but I thought, oh Lord, she's about to tell me something about her family. But she looked real nervous and she was looking down and she checked out until I looked at the totality of my four things on the checkout. And I, and I discovered her discomfort. <laughs> so the first one was, of course, little girl panties. They were Dora the Explorer panties. Now, I had to get my daughter some underwear, so that's fine. <laughs> now, we've been out, it's a summer day, we've been out running around, and so we kind of, our allergies, so I had some children's Benadryl. That didn't look good with the little girl panties. <laughs> Now, on top of that, my son was starting to play in sports, and so I had a coupon, so I bought a baseball bat. So now I have a baseball bat, little girl panties, and some children's Benadryl. The last item that I put up there really was probably censure, because it was duct tape. So I had duct tape, little girl panties, some children's Benadryl, Baseball First of all, I paid with cash because I didn't want her name. And I was going to my car thinking they're zooming in on me right now. <laughs> I'm just glad there wasn't a sale on ski caps, ski pass, because I would be in jail right now. Or if I was driving a van, I would be out. <laughs> but you see these things, they're constant. You know, there's things, there's perceptions. We have perceptions because there's two different perceptions you can see from this. One, it's a person who is concerned about whoever may be riding with me later, or it could be a perception of a good father. I'm getting my daughter some new drawers. I'm getting some medication because we're, you know, my son wanted a baseball bat. I don't remember, remember why I needed it. Okay, but, but that's always good. So it's about your perception. So one thing you want to do is document, document, document. Write down. Write this stuff down. I'm not talking remember it. I'm not talking you. I remember when we talked to Joe. No, you write this down because this is evidence. You get this. How does an employee react to allegations? When you confront someone, when you recognize someone is a potentially a violent person, first of all, what we tend to do is we ignore it until it's too late. I, I don't want you to ignore it. You can be respectful and inquisitive both in the same way. If you ignore it, then you just, uh, uh, you just perpetuate, you just set up situations that could be potentially violent. Because what I want to talk to you today about is about how to prevent it before it happens. We do this very well at our hospital. We do it because it saves people's lives. So we know when someone potentially can be violent to someone else. We recognize that way before it starts to happen. We see those warning signs. So how they, and you know, I talked about it, about what is the sex of the person because a majority of, of workplace violence are men. It just happens to be men. I don't know why. We're just more aggressive. Although I don't know if that's true. Because like I said, I have that son and that daughter. So, my son my son was about uh, nine years old. And my daughter was uh, four years younger. They actually share the same birthday. It's just four years apart. And so, one time my son was playing, or my daughter was playing with my, one of my son's toys. And he walked over and snatched it out of her hand. Now, my rule at my house is my children have to resolve their own conflicts. If I have to get involved, the, both of them are not going to like the result. So I let them. So my son went over, snatched the, the toy out of my daughter's hand, and my daughter didn't say anything. She didn't do anything. And I was just sitting over to the side, and I go, uh-oh. And he goes, what? And I said, my, my limited experience uh, about women is that if you do something to them, and they don't immediately react, Something's going to happen later, you know. <laughs> so let me just confirm to you, if I have to drive you to the hospital, I will. So 
Three hours later, it had been a very torrential rain that day, and we walked out, the rain had stopped, we walked out on the front porch, and I have a front porch about this high, and my son's looking at some little woolly bugs that are going, and his sister's right behind him, he's leaning over, she takes one finger and just pushes him <laughs> off the, he falls, and he's laying like on the ground. He goes, what, what happened? She goes, you fell. <laughs> It in his face. He goes, what happened? I go, she says you fell. <laughs> he goes, is she going to get in trouble? And I said, no, I kind of warned you about this. I'm, I'm picking my battles, you know? But if you have a person that comes in and you learn that they have a history of, of motor vehicle infractions, if they have a history of child abuse or spouse abuse, if they have a bad temper, if they have any kind of prior, you're only going to get this if you inquire, if you seek this information. You've got to identify the victim, who this happened to. What is this specific person's name? Does the employee have access to weapons? That is fair to ask them. You know, did they? Uh, do you have a weapon in your car? Do you have a weapon on you? You never know nowadays. <laughs> These are questions that you ask when you've identified a person that potentially is um, a violent. Do they have a history of substance abuse? Again, all these things you don't know unless you inquire. If you get this situation where, well, I don't know anything about, I don't know any of these things about my employees, well, you're not a really good employer, are you? Because you've now set everyone else, including yourself, in a situation that's potentially violent. Studies show that of all the many variables that are being studied in models for the prediction of violence, substance abuse is the most prevalent. And when I say substance abuse, you now, we now have to include prescription medication as a part. I'm not saying that people who have prescription medication are substance abusers. Absolutely not. I'm saying that we have to now, you know, people think that only the heroin addicts with tracks in their arm are going to shoot me at work. That's not true. It could be someone who's been continuously abusing opiates for a long time. That was legally prescribed to them. Does an employee have a psychiatric illness? You know, you, you know, you have to establish, if your company doesn't have an EAP, an Employee Assistance Program, then you need to seek a, a, a remedy to that very problem because everywhere needs an employee assistance program. It shows that they're more productive. It shows that people are more stable. If you offer health insurance, you should also offer mental health as well. And that reduces the situation. Does the employee have a social network that, that they can look to for assistance? It could be that employee assistance program that I talked about. Violence rarely occurs without a recent loss. If you have someone grieving, if you have someone who's just lost their job, if, they, if you've had someone who's just divorced, if you've had someone who, who is just went through a bankruptcy, all of these are potential warning signs. I'm not saying that they're just suddenly warning signs. Don't be watching and following the guy that just had a bankruptcy. Lord, he's about to shoot us all. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that won't happen. I'm just saying that's not a sole factor. We talked about that EAP, EAP Employee Assistance Program. Have that. Almost every company has an employee assistance program. Program. If you don't, talk to me. Talk to Mary Lou. We can find you a place that can get it. It is cost effective and it can save lives. Not only group lives, but individual lives. Are there subjective factors? Some people may invoke fear. You know those people. Don't point them out in this room. Because every time I do this, they're like, there he is. He's right there. <laughs> yeah. There's some people who just make you nervous. Who you're just uncomfortable around. I'm not saying that that person is a perpetrator, but something in your mind is telling you to beware. All I'm telling you is to listen to that inner voice, as long as it's not audible, like if you don't literally hear it. We'll talk about that later. But if you are just, the mental health people will get that, but uh, the, um, if you hear, you know, we always hear that whenever you're 
you're trying to make a decision, who are you talking to when you're going to shoot? That's your inner voice. That's your, your primary uh, brain. Um, I think it went for a while. So, you know, often we've got that situation where in Houston we have a problem. We have employees that we need to worry about. Because we see these warning signs. We see all those. And then let's say we have a situation where an employee has made a threat. What is a threat? We think the threat is someone's just called and said they're going to kill everybody. That obviously is a threat. That's not just a threat. The employee says, you know, we hear those threats. You know what? I'm going to be the last person that works here. That's a threat. You're going to regret me leaving. That's a threat. Be it when we're not intuitive interventionists, we've got to confront people. We've got to uh, uh, speak to that person. Communication is the most important part. We've got to confront them. But when you confront someone, you have to listen. Don't wait. How many of us do this? How many of us wait uh, for someone to stop talking so we can say our next thing? I do that all the time. I can never remember anybody's name because I'm thinking, what am I going to say to this person? And then I miss their name. And it's, it's hard, but we've got to be active listeners in this situation. We've got to find outside referrals, whether they're the police department, whether they're psychiatrists, whether they're emergency rooms, whether they're private practice clinicians. We've got to access them. We've got to understand if the employee's fit for duty. They're fit to be it. Does this person need to be here? Do we need to get them to sign a release that they don't, uh, uh, are, aren't effective? We've got to communicate with these individuals. We've got to make a determination. Because what it comes down to is that although you have a person that's in, that's making a threat to you, or what it comes down to is you have an employee that's in crisis. There's a reason why we've got to this situation. And when you help this person, when you find them help, when you are genuine about your help, then you're going to help them. You're going to make your safety a priority. Because what we do at my hospital is that we're not going, when we feel like someone's going to be violent, we don't take them out before they take us out. We understand, you know, I mean, I wanted to, but, you know, they're, they're having mental health issues. And, and there have been times where I've been um, battered, assaulted, but I understand at work, not not Delta, but at work, and uh, I'm going to say that in front so they don't hear me. But, um, so what it comes down to is that it's it's not oh Lord. So it's not that person's uh, it's not that person's fault. It isn't. And really, when it comes down to um, someone who's having a workplace violence, it's not necessarily their fault either. I mean, they're responsible. There's a difference between is it your fault and are you responsible. You as an employer are responsible because this is your employee and you're a human being. Not this fellow man. Um, but we can see those situations. We can recognize... Oh, it's so nice. There we go. All right. So it's still, you can recognize these situations and we're communicative about it. So you're going to leave here with this. You're going to leave here with one. Be aware of your surroundings. Understand where you are, what you're doing, how I am. When you're aware of your surroundings, aware of what you are doing. If you hear your brain saying, this is a dangerous situation... This is a dangerous situation. It might not be imminently dangerous. It might not be you're about to die. But it's something your brain has said. Please, especially ladies, please listen to that part of your brain. The other is communication. That's all it is about this is communication. When you have someone that you think is a threat, talk to them. Talk to them with respect. Treat them like you would want to be treated. Inquire into that. Why are you angry? What's going on? When you're letting someone go, if you have an employee that you're letting go, be direct, be clear and concise, and be respectful. 
That's what it comes down to. If you're those things, you will reduce your potential for workplace violence by 64% if you follow those three things. Understand that uh, workplace violence doesn't just happen. There are warning signs up to it. I'm a big advocate of, you know, companies have uh, warning systems. So if an employee makes a first infraction, they get a warning. And then an employee makes the next, then we go to uh, evaluation. That I personally don't think employees uh, should be given any kind of warning. You're given a warning by saying, this is how you work here. Because when you give warnings, you're giving them the potential to be infractors, so to speak. I made that word up, but I like that. <laughs> you get you get to you you give them a chance to uh, offend, so to speak. That's a harsh word and, and drastic, but you give them multiple times to be. I, I I'm not a big liker of uh, um you know what's it called? No no uh, what's it called? I'm trying to. Think. Yes, just, just, you know, you have no chance of any kind of warning, but when you look at situations, you understand that it has to be, you have to understand that it's scary at the first. And if you give someone a warning, well, okay, you're saying, all right, I know you broke the rules, and I understand that, you know, don't do it again. Because you can ask my children, you can ask my children, they can answer any question that I that they already want to ask me. They already know the answer. You don't really have to ask me this question because you know the answer. You ask the question because you want a different answer. You know, that's it. So, does anybody have any questions that you want to ask? Any situations? I've probably got 45 seconds to make it a quick question. So, yes, sir. Bradley, probably as much as uh, a threat can be intimidating, that first step for an employee to notify someone else has got to be almost as big a threat to them. Yeah. What's your advice about how to prepare and how to go about sharing that information with someone that you think might be a threat or threat? That's a great question. First of all, your company needs to have a apparatus, a part where this is how you report these things. One company has to do that. You also have to have an active shooter. That's scarier than it is, but an active shooter policy. How you will react when a situation comes to that. The next is you have to encourage your employees to be communicative. I told you communication is the second most important thing. Be aware of your surroundings, then communicate. If you feel threatened, you have to decide, like I began this with, is your dignity more important than your safety? So if you feel threatened, first of all, don't be overly dramatic about it. You're not really that important. I mean, you know, it's not, oh my God, Eddie just threatened to kill me. Well, Eddie probably threatened three other people to kill too, so you're not that important. <laughs> Don't be so dramatic. It's not. Anytime uh, uh, workplace violence, it's really not about the individual in which it's perpetrated on. It's about the perpetrator. So when you understand you're not that really key to this whole thing, it was just opportunity. Understand that you, if you feel threatened, then communicate it. Communicate it clearly. Communicate it with dignity, but say, you know, I feel a little uncomfortable when so-and-so said this to me. It includes sexual harassment, it includes just uh, inappropriate behavior, it includes... But don't overblow it. If you overblow it, that's not good communication and you can make a situation worse. Be a grown adult when you communicate at work. Be a grown adult. Adults interact differently than children interact. We, there's so many people that we work with that are just really tall 14-year-olds. You know, that's all they are. 14-year-olds, but they're just, they have a mortgage and they're really tall. Now, understand that, that you've got to be communicative. Say, have that, access your employee handbook, how do I report this, and then be respectful when you report it. Understand that there's different situations. Remember that perception, that perception I talked about is important. Understand that, you know, it might be a, just a good father instead of a serial killer pedophile. You know, so understand that. Thank you, my, 